my computer. I can upload this to the YouTube later. Um, okay, so I got recording and I got my screen and everything. Okay, awesome. Um, hey folks, uh, so I'm uh, Steven. Uh, thank you all for showing up and I hope that uh, you, you think that you'll think that this is a cool project and you'll be interested in authoring exercises. Um, I should say, you know, nothing's wrong with your speakers. My voice is just like this. Um, that's a somewhat recent development, but not recent enough that it shouldn't be better now, but hopefully it will be soon. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, well, I think what I'm going to do today is uh, first I'm going to show you guys a preview of the new uh, public website um, that I'll be launching this spring with any uh, exercises that um, are authored for the platform, assuming you don't have to put your exercises on the public website if you don't want to. But certainly, I think it would be a great uh, contribution to the community if you're going to write exercises for a course to make them available for other instructors to use as well. Um, so I'm going to show you with that new uh, public facing website and then I'm going to kind of give a quick demo uh, developing a, uh, um, I guess maybe we can have, there's only three of us, I should definitely have you all introduce yourselves and uh, maybe mention which uh, class or area of math you're interested in authoring exercises for. Um, John, why don't you go first? I don't know. Were you talking to me? I, I actually was saying John Sebastian, but oh, you're okay. John, so you can all watch. Go ahead. You're on. You're off mute. So yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ports. I teach at Colorado State University of Pueblo. I'm interested in any math. Actually, I teach a mixture of lower level and more advanced things. So I, I could see a valuable use for this in any context. And I'm just, I, I support a lot of um, open textbook writing on my campus. So, you know, figuring out how we can add interactivity would, could really be the, the key thing that gets us into using more of these kind of shared resources. So I think this is a great thing to, to see. Sebastian. Sorry, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so I mean, just, just, I just, 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 why don't you uh, post an, a quick introduction in chat? Sorry about the microphone. Uh, Debbie, why don't you introduce yourself in the meantime? Hi, my name is Debbie Gatiss, and I teach at Penn State University Greater Allegheny Campus. It's a small sa satellite campus um, near Pittsburgh, and uh, I mostly teach Calc 1 and Business Calc, so a lot of overlap in the um, problem banks for those. So uh, that's kind of my main interest. I usually um, am teaching a section of our intro to stat class also. So that 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 might come into the mix, but I'm most I'm mostly about the calculus. That's definitely the biggest area for uh, um, expansion for, for what's written for the platform. So what we have this is the current website that uh, is published and right now we have two courses, differential equations and linear algebra. And they're they both could definitely be brought in scope. You know, they they were written for differential equations and linear algebra at my university, the University of South Alabama. Um so uh yeah there's definitely room for also adding more standards to those courses for, for areas of those and i should mention that uh there is an nsf grant not specifically for this platform but uh for team based learning uh, in linear algebra and so definitely this is going to get linear algebra is going to get a lot of attention from the participants in that uh nsf grant coming up it's a three-year grant that's about to start here in a couple months so there'll definitely be uh, some some additional learning outcomes added um to support instructors at universities that have different um, expectations for those for this course. Um, this is just the only person using DiffyQ is me, so I wrote the ones that were important for my course and in my institution. Um, but there's probably you know other things that could be added there, and so we could talk a little bit maybe uh, about uh, contributing to other people's libraries as well, uh, maybe a little bit later. 
Um, so Sean, I'm going to put your chat on screen for the, for the YouTube. Um, cause I'm not the best narrator at the moment. Um, but yeah, we have, uh, school level between high school and university and we got linear algebra and calculus so i think definitely i'm going to talk about calculus today um for uh, the example that i'll do quickly to start the exercise draw creating an exercise bank for calculus and so uh, but first like i said i want to show off uh because i'm super proud of this i've kind of kind of did a deep dive into and, and learning a new uh, technology called Svelte, um, which was made this really easy to make, um, but it's a lot better than the version, a lot quicker than what's currently on the website, because this one, you know, you know, it's not super slow, but it's still not the fastest thing in the world, um, but this one's pretty darn slick, so right now I just have DiffyQ ported over, but you can immediately go to any of these learning outcomes that you want. Let me turn off instructor and stuff. So this is what you might point a student to um, at the, you know, the, the easiest application is you want to give a student extra homework. And so you send them to the website. You might, if you have a specific learning outcome in mind, Laplace transforms to solve IVPs. You can share the full URL with them. And uh, they have as you know, 50 is the default right now for different versions of this problem goes up to 50. Um, you can use your keyboard as well. You can use your keyboard to show an eye at the answer or just click it like so. It's the, by default, that's the biggest, uh, I think pretty useful just by itself as a way to quickly author randomized exercises. So if you want to give your students a problem set, um, you don't have to sit there and write out 10 different problems that match that learning outcome. You write one problem with enough randomization um, and it'll just produce as many as you, you know, like I said, 50 is way more than I think a student needs to be able to do to practice for this particular learning outcome. But uh, students are satisfied with having, you know, as much as they want, basically. Although if you want it, if they really want to do 100, you could produce 100 just as easily. So uh, that's basically what you can do on the website currently. Um, over here, although it's a little bit quicker on this version, uh, the real neat thing that's new is the instructor options. So let's say you've done all this work and now you want to give them a test. Well, let's say I want to give a test on uh, the D standard or the D outcome. So I'm going to go to the D outcome. I'm going to make uh, one question on the assessment for each of these. Actually, uh, D one's pretty easy. I'll put two on that one. Go to this assessment builder that gets hidden if uh, you don't have the instructor options on. Um, right, so I had two D ones. I want them to be by each other. And uh, I can add more if I want. I can train them, move them around if I want. With one click and I generate. You can see here a five exercise quiz or assessment, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you can copy paste the LaTeX into uh, your favorite uh, LaTeX editor, or you could just one click and overleaf. And uh, it'll produce it for you and compile it for you and you can edit it however you want. But now you have in a world where we can actually see our students in person, you can print a PDF, a piece of paper, and collect their answers and terms. Um, hopefully, in the future, that won't be as scary. Um, but there it is. Um, so that took me, you know, if I, as long as I want to assess the outcomes that are on the platform, it takes you like, you know, you can make like 10 versions of this in like two minutes. Like it's a, it's a I'm, I'm really happy that this uh, PDF production is, I've gotten that to be pretty uh, bored. Um, so this is how I used to assess. Um, these days, I don't see students in person anymore. So there is support. Um, not through this website currently, but on the back end that I'm going to show you as an author, when you write these exercises, oh, I should have done this uh, ahead of time. Um, give me a second. I'm going to try and quickly pull it up on my end. But there's a way um, on my end to, and if you have Canvas and we're looking to support additional um, platforms in the future. There's a format that they all should support, but there's a little nitpicky things that you have to uh, tweak about these platforms. Once I'm sure I've got student data off of this browser on my other monitor, I'll show you a preview. 
So you're talking about using LTI to get to the to yeah. campus? Yeah, LTI and uh, I think QTI is a subset of LTI. Or, um, but there's an open, there's a there's a standard for authoring uh, content for a course to be put in an LMS online. And I'm actually this is my colleague Drew Lewis um, did the. Uh, the actual work of tracking down an example of this for Canvas. And he wrote a mock-up of what he wanted it to look like. And then I bring my software to produce. Um, he had a working version, actually, the, of his own. But then I, I did some, uh, I refactored it and, and, and made it the version that you see here. But you can see how this is a, a C3 problem. So you can compare with uh, the C3 standard. Oh, gee, a second order. Um, so, and uh, you can, I should mention that, you know, for every problem that you author, if you choose to host it on the public library, then, um, you know, it produces uh, 50 or 100, you know, some, some number on the public site. You can produce some totally separate versions that you would actually put on your quizzes. And so on my exercise bank, um, I could go back, I think, and show you an exercise bank uh, without showing student data. Um, Yes, this is fine. So basically it produces question banks on the back end 100. You can make it more if you want to have more versions. I kind of wish I did two or 300 to be honest, because I have about 50 students and they all see a different version. So to prevent too many collisions, I might put two or 300 next time. But you can see here it produces, you know, as many as you want. Um, it actually uses, um, this thing called latex.codecox.com to do the actual latex formatting. So if your LMS does not support uh, math checks, like Canvas doesn't actually, um, we have a workaround for that um, to produce uh, images that can be embedded in the problem and viewable to students. And then uh, it is also accessible because uh, and that's a big issue as well. You can see here the alt text. They can read the latex source and the alt text. So there's accessibility for students who can't read an image as well. Same with the, uh, the public website. Uh, actually, I think this is MathML that's produced right here. So if I go, um, where'd I go? Oh, this is too big. Yeah. It's actually KTEX, it's, it's like MathJax, but you can see here there is, um, I believe somewhere there should be a nice version. It's been a while. Yeah, there's some MathML viewable here. Yeah, so here's- so Does your site use MathML? Uh, sorry, use uh, MathJax or something different from MathJax? So as an author, you'll write LaTeX. Um, what, the, what happens magically by the software that takes the stuff that you've authored is it will uh, it's sort of like pretext if you're familiar with that you write it once in an xml format and then the software does the magic of producing different output formats and so right now what we have is uh, um for the website it produces um LaTeX, which is ingested by this KTEX plugin, which then also produces the MathML. But what I, I was wanting to confirm, because I actually didn't check for accessibility, is that somewhere deep inside, probably too deep, I should talk to somebody who knows more about accessibility, is there is a plain text readable with a screen reader version of the problem that students can get to, um, just like there is on my uh, canvas, wherever that went, over here, web page. Like so. So that's what we're aiming towards. Other kind of plans for this website is there's a lot of existing work. And what's different about this platform versus like your your web works and your other platforms is that this is completely serverless. If you want to just share a bunch of random math problems with students, this is a website that you can just point them to. You don't have to get somebody to to, to open up a web work server for you. I know there's a lot of public ones out there, like the, like the American Institute of Mathematics, um, I believe is pretty nice about helping you with your getting started, especially open a web work server. But even still, it's a lot of pain to open and maintain a server. This is just flat HTML. If I just want HTML and a bunch of JavaScript that runs this public website. And if you want to actually assess, the goal is rather than getting another platform like a my math lab or a web work server is we're looking to integrate with existing LMSs that you're already used or forced to use. Might as well take advantage of them and give you ways to integrate with those instead. 
And so that's the that's the design philosophy of the check it system versus these other platforms that'll let you author random math exercises. Um, so uh, any questions about just in general the the outputs that if you're gonna put work into this, the outputs you can get out of it. Jonathan. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um so but so for example, in Canvas or even you directly using one of these URLs that you said you, you mentioned you could just send to the students, that produces a question. And then how would you use use this for assessing the student? I mean, so we're like in Canvas. So would there, there's a blank text box that the students would write their answer into. Yes. And, they, and what format would they use to write their answer in? So they write it however they want. So I guess the other big clarification that I should make uh, now before I, if this is important to you, is that there's no check it is about checking student understanding. It's not about automatically checking for correctness. So um, let's go back to a quiz and preview it. So if you're a student, this is what you see. And so, uh, to answer it, once everything loads, they can type out, you know, if they want. What most of my students do is they upload an image and they write it by hand. So the uh, what I can't show you because of student data privacy is the speed grader in Canvas. Um, this is meant for instructors to check student understanding. So instructors still have to grade. Um, there is no automatic checking of the final answer. Um, done by the system or your LMS. This is about giving students and you a quick way to, in an analog fashion, create questions that allow you to check student um, understanding. Uh, Debbie says in chat, why don't you just say that out loud, Debbie? Yeah, I've been, it's kind of the first semester I've really been using Canvas this way. Um, partly because I've just started doing mastery based grading and partly because um, thank you COVID. Uh, but I've been doing sort of the weekly online learning target quizzes and I load up questions on Canvas, of course, manually, not with the fancy stuff because that's why I'm here to learn. Um, so I load up the, the questions for the quiz on Canvas. So they open the quiz, so the quiz times them and then I have them upload a, in a separate Dropbox assignment the PDF of their written work. And then that can be graded in SpeedGrader. A, a chemistry colleague of mine um, does this with, in Blackboard, this is something similar to what you were showing, Stephen, about, about having them upload. They, they take pictures with their cell phone of the handwritten solutions of chem, some chemistry problems, so. Yeah. Great scope as a platform I've used for that sort of thing in the past. And I would continue using it, except that we already have the Canvas, or we just switched to Canvas. And so um, I'm trying to keep them in the uh, LMS. So um, great. Well, I'm just getting a text. And uh, so I'm actually on the Gulf Coast where that hurricane you may have heard about is, is it's not here yet. I don't want to be on the phone, but I do want me to. Uh, uh, move on and then quickly show you guys. Unfortunately, I have to make this a little bit shorter than I wanted so I can go ahead and uh, possibly make preparations if we're gonna um, do that besides hunker down. So, uh, okay, let's go ahead and just dig into the good stuff. So this will all produce at the end. How do we write a problem? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, show the, on the, the actual website that you can get to by checkit.clons.org or the preview, actually, they both have a link to this readme on GitHub. So I, I pulled it up here already. So uh, what you would do is you go to checkit.clons.org, click on the, I want to author, go to the readme, the read, excuse me, the readme. Um, now you're getting started as an author. It tells you to open the template project. And it uses something called CoCalc, so you don't have to install anything on your computer in order to be able to write things. There's a web app that basically creates a virtual machine for you called GoCalc that you can use for this purpose. That'll pull up this page here and it'll let you open it with one click. And so in incognito mode, I uh, did that uh, already. And so uh, one thing I'll just warn you is that for some reason I saw this bug today. It may, it's slow, but if you have a free account, especially, um, 
uh, they want you to pay money to have actual, uh, you know, speedier uh, booting up. Um, but one thing I did want to warn you, if you want to try this out now or later when you watch the video, and I'll post this on YouTube and post it on the, uh, you can contact me by Twitter or go to the Mastery Grading uh, Slack and I'll post a link to the YouTube when it's up. But uh, yeah, you can, um, I just had to refresh. That's basically what I'm saying is I had, I had this bug for some reason, but if I refreshed it, it went away. So not sure why that is. I'll have to fix that. Um, but you can't get rid of that. And so uh, in the base, and if you watch the video from the Mastery Grading Conference I did a few months ago, I showed off this tutorial, which is a very simple um, version of what we see here. Um, on authoring an, an exercise, but y'all are here because you're interested in maybe authoring a whole bank of problems. So let me just show you that, skip ahead to that process. So if we go to, this is the, the root folder of the project. You'll see here the tutorial, which we're not gonna talk about. That's just good for quickly playing around with things and has some instructions. But let's say you wanna make a bank. All right. So the bank is centered around you have a method to preview. I'm sorry, my kid is invading. One second. Is my mic fixing? Is it better? better? No, no. Sorry about that. Okay. The, uh, this thing right here. So if you haven't used a Jupyter Notebook before, you could just control enter to run a piece of code. It's just a little bit more convenient. We can just hit the run button. It's gonna be slow though right now because I'm on the free tier. But here we have a quick way to preview from the linear algebra library, the one objective like so. And then when we're ready to build we can just run this right here and I'll show you how that looks in a moment to build all the versions. So, um, but we're here to learn how to do a new bank. So let's go ahead. And uh, so for your convenience, if you open this up, you get two banks, the ones that are currently on the website to start with. So I'm gonna copy, um, we're gonna talk about calculus, so I'll copy differential equations, why not? Um, and I'm gonna call this uh, awesome calculus. Bank, whatever you want. And so I'm going to uh, just edit an existing um, outcome. And so uh, I don't know, I'll just call it x1 because x is a good calculus variable. So when you're authoring these things, there are two files that you want to author. There's the Sage file. Sage is like Python, it's a programming language. This has all, this will capture all the logic of creating your problem. The PTX stands for pretext. That's the language that uh, is used to write a lot of open source textbooks. It's also the language that we've taken to, to use as our model for writing the actual like presentation of a problem and its solution for students. And so uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm just going to delete all this. And let's do a, uh, maybe let's do a product rule with a little bit of trig. So I don't know what I would call that learning outcome, but maybe that's what I want my students to be able to do. So uh, what am I going to have to do? The first thing I always do is start with the logic behind uh, the problem. So uh, if it's calculus, my variable is probably going to be x. Um, I may have a Y as well. And so I've written a lot of Sage code, so I know a lot of this cruft already. So if you ever wanna know how to do something in Sage, I should probably put this as a resource somewhere. You just search for Sage, it's a hard but Sage math. You shall pull up what you want. And you find the documentation right here. And maybe there's a tutorial right here. And so you can get like assignment. So there's a lot of resources there. So this is a programming language you can look up for the details. But I want to write a problem about X and Y. And then uh, let's see here. What I might do is skip ahead and kind of say what my function is going to be F. Okay. And I want F to be uh, something like a trig times a variable or a polynomial. 
maybe. Okay, so that's gonna be kind of my goal. So I'll put a comment here. I want the, the F prime computed. I'm spalling. So then, um, let's see, for a placeholder, I won't do randomness yet. I'll just put the same trick as sign, and sign's a built-in function in Sage. And then my polynomial will be then x squared. All right, so then um, that's gonna be all the math that I need here. Um, well, I need to know what f prime is. So the derivative, just the derivative with respect to x. So a lot of the, the authoring process is just learning the Sage code that you need. It's just like, you know, if you're writing web work, you'd have to learn what Perl is to write a web work problem. But the thing about Sage and the reason why I went with Sage is that it's mathematical software. Perl is a general purpose programming language, but Sage is meant for authoring mathematics or, or working with mathematics. So that will uh, give you a lot of things out of the box for free, like trig. So um, there we have it. Now I need to, now what would I need to show a student? I need to return that. It's what's called a, a, a dictionary in Python and Sage. So I need to tell them what F is. I need to tell them what the derivative is. It's kind of repetitive. If I wanted to save a line, I guess I could put the derivative computation down here instead and not call it anything up here. I guess I'll do that. I have to know, regret when I make that decision because then I realize I need this for something else as well. So I should have defined it earlier, but for now, maybe it'll be fine. Okay, let's take a look at presentation. Whatever I return is what I'm allowed to use in my presentation. So that's the, the pretext file that corresponds to it. And so I need an exercise that has to have a statement and an answer. And so find the derivative. And so uh, this, uh, this is uh, not the notation I would have used, but it's an existing notation. It's something called XSL that's useful for this, for writing these templates. And so I want to display what I called, I called it F. So I will just say, am I f of x equals, and then I'll display my f. My answer should be the derivative. Now I've done enough authoring, you know, I still have to, to go back and actually get the randomness in there, but let's go ahead and make sure that this is, I, I may have screwed up and made a syntax error or something. So I'm gonna go back to my preview here. I'm gonna rerun the preview, which you can do with this run button, or just hit control enter. Um, oh, I have to point it at the right place. So what I call, I call the, the library, it's called awesome calculus. And the objective was x1. What the, they have asked to batch the file name there. All right, there we have it. So uh, there it is by function, find the derivative, and here's the answer. Of course, I didn't put anything random, um, so I better show you how to do random stuff. Um, any questions about that so far? Okay, so um, let's put randomness in there. So randomness, there are two things that I use a lot when I do random things in, the, in these Python, or in, the, in these Sage uh, generators. Um, you do have to call it a generator function, the way the program is set up. But I want my trig, first of all, I don't want it to always be sine. I may want it to be cosine. And that's where the choice function comes into play. So I'll say my trig will be a choice of sine or cosine. Okay, it does some saving automatically, but I can click it manually as well. Um, that should be enough to change my logic so that sometimes it'll say cosine. Sometimes it'll say sine. Eventually it'll say sine, there it goes. Um, not a lot of randomness, I better add some more randomness. So let's give it a coefficient. Um, where'd it go? Get rid of that now. So back in the Sage code, um, let's add a coefficient. Rather than 
doing a choice, I'm going to do a random range. And I'm going to have a pick a number between zero and nine. 10 is not inclusive here. And I'm going to multiply it down here in my F. I can make this bigger. Why well, should do that? Okay. So um, make sure it saves. Run the preview again. Now we have different coefficients showing up. Uh, that's a problem. That's going to be a boring problem. Okay, so let's make sure. So this is the workaround I do. So I rarely start my range at zero. I usually start at either one or two. And I like to have a, for, for problems that have equal difficulty across, I often start my random numbers at two so that at least something will show up for everybody. Now, another thing I might do is maybe I want negatives as well. That's where I'm gonna use the choice function again and choose a random number of zero or one to multiply with it. And now if I go back, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, probably. Did I mess it up? Did I forget to save? Let me save it, and try it again. There we go. I told you sometimes randomly it's negative, hey. All right, so, um, what else do we need to do here? Oh yeah, my polynomial. Uh, I call it a polynomial. It's probably just a single term, but maybe I want my degree to be random. All right, well, rand range. Um, let's make it between two up to five. And then uh, save that now. See here. All right, so that kind of gives you the gist of what a problem would look like. Um, and that's really all you have to do um, to, to author a single problem. Do you have any questions about that um, from that brief demonstration? Cool. All right, well then what happens when you've constructed an entire bank? Um, well, what else needs to be authored? Well, first of all, the software needs to know uh, you might have a bunch of files in this folder. Some of them may be unused. I put mine in an unused folder, but you can have files in here that you don't actually use. So there's a special bank XML file that you'll use to tell it to define things about your problems. Like for example, what is the title of this outcome? And so first of all, I'm calling this awesome calculus. Um, log needs to be unique compared to other libraries uh, or banks I should say of problems so I'll just call it awesome dash calculus and that's the part gonna be part of URLs in the website and other sorts of applications of this um, I'm gonna pretend that I wrote all these different things but I did change x1 so here I had some commented stuff out that I never used so I can just get rid of that but x1 I changed now it's uh, now it's actually product rule with trig. Actually, I want to have a more, uh, instead of a short title, I want an actual like action verb uh, learning outcome at the end of this course. Students will be able to, you know, good practice for actually writing outcomes. Um, you can always put that in there if you want, just call it something like description. That may not be official yet, but it's probably what I will call it. Um, students will be able to compute the derivative. That, uh, probably someday I'll support that, but right now it's ignored. Um, cool. So basically you author as many of these with the preview, you can check it out. You author as many of these as you want um, for your course. And then when you're happy with what that looks like, you, you, uh, you well, the last thing you want to do is build it. And so I called this, um, um, oh, uh, I should be more careful. The slug here, actually, it doesn't matter what it is. It should match the the file path, which it does. Awesome dash calculus. Those need to match, which they do, which is good. So now when I go to build, now I'm going to build awesome calculus. And I'm going to run. In retrospect, I should have gotten rid of all these outcomes because it's going to try and build everything, and it does take some time. Um, it's not even going to get to the stuff that it, I actually cared about that I wrote today. But you can see here that it's building in the background. I can show you as it works in the awesome calculus folder. 
in the uh, build folder. And I just realized this is running a slightly out of date version of the software. That's, I need to update that. That's on me. I made some upgrades and improvements that I did not reflect in this thing you can get to from the website. So that's, I'm going to do this after this talk. But as it's building, you can see it's uh, F1 takes a while. So I'm not surprised that it stopped there. Um, we could go back and check on it. Um, yeah, so it's F1 actually does some. Uh, um, numerical methods and, and for differential equations. And so that's why it's taking so long. But uh, in the build folder, you can see what it's trying to build. For each of these problems, it creates your QTI, which is part of that LTI standard, uh, the HTML and the tech. And the HTML is what shows up on like the website, for example. And because CoCalc doesn't have math checks, it doesn't look super pretty, but you can see a quick preview and get some quick confirmation that it looks reasonable for the build. Um, what else does it get? Um, yeah, there's pretext, there's tech. Oh, and I didn't show you on the website earlier while this is building. Um, on the new version of the website, if you're an instructor and you don't want to, you know, if an author just wants to, I'm sorry, if an instructor just wants to use like copy paste into, into Canvas, they could get to it, the source, or copy paste it, just a single problem into a, an exam. They can get to it uh, from here. Uh, the, the HTML, they take in the pretext if they're interested in that as well. So those are all featured if you decide to publish your bank on the public website. Those are features that you can have. Um, going back to the building process. Um, library build complete, awesome. So what else should I show you that came around about as a result of this? Well, um, in addition to each individual outcome, having those little snippets that you could put in various websites and tech documents and whatnot, there's the QTI bank, which is that those files that your canvas will need. So if I was going to put this in a canvas, what I would do is go here and I would go to QTI bank and um, go to uh, download the whole folder as a zip file. Maybe I'll call it awesome calculus. And this is documented somewhere. Um, but now if I were to take this zip and upload it to Canvas, I automatically have my problem banks I could put in my quizzes in Canvas. And so like I said, one day hopefully we'll figure out support for other LMSs as well. Um, the last thing is this another Canvas specific thing is uh, this will get your outcomes proficient in Canvas automatically as well. There's still a little bit of manual stuff you have to do, but this is a quick way to at least get all the words built in there. There's my new product role with Trig right there that I just authored as a part of this process. So that's really it. Um, you make a bunch of Sage files. You make a bunch of uh, pretext files. Just zoomed in on this earlier. Um, but um, yeah, that's kind of the workflow. So the last thing is, um, I did not mention things like uh, uh, Git um, and other ways of taking your work and sharing your work. And um, the workflow I have in mind is this, if you want to author, you know, you can use author this on your own through Kogak on your own, use it on your own however you want. And ping me anytime if you have questions. Um, but um, especially if you, want, if you want to put these on the website someday, uh, I can either do a separate workshop on teaching you how to get this stuff on GitHub, which is, you know, uh, if you go to GitHub, here is where I've shared uh, publicly on GitHub um, and what I would eventually need um, in order to get this on the website. Um, I could well, I could talk about that um, with you, or I could just do it for you. That step um, to to get this kind of shared publicly, I'd be happy to help you with that once you have a bank actually authored. Um, so so that's uh, just something where you could just contact me through Twitter or through the Mastery Crane Slack about getting this kind of uh, published to the world, and I'll be happy to help with that. Okay. Um, Cool. That's really about all I had prepared for this uh, quick uh, workshop presentation today. Um, 
So yeah, right now, um, so yeah, two questions from, from Jean Sebastian. Can you import a library in the Sage? Yes. Um, anything that's part of the standard Sage distribution, you can use. Um, if it's part of Python, like, you know, uh, if you could pip install it from Python, you could still use that in Sage. That's a little bit more advanced, I think, for, um, that's not something that's necessary, but if you're a power user, you certainly could. If you uh, go calc, um, you know, if it's a full virtual machine, you can go here and you can uh, pull up a terminal. And so this is purely, an, um, you know, optional, but you certainly could. Um, you know, I, want, I forget what it is, Sage, um, pep install, um, whatever. So if there's a Python library that you want to use as a part of the standard distribution, you can support that. There's not support. We should, if that's something you actually want to do, let me know, and I will add it to uh, the metadata here somewhere so that the software automatically knows that it needs to be installed if other users want to be able to replicate your work later. But that's something that is possible. Just let me know if you actually want to do it so I can make sure there's proper support for it for other authors and other users of the end product as well. But again, the nice thing about this is that, again, you're not setting up a server. It's at the end of the day, what are you producing? A bunch of five HTML files. You can stick those on the internet wherever you want. And it doesn't have to know what Sage Math even is in order to share your work with other people. Uh, so it's a very um, portable, unbrittle solution compared with a lot of other, you know, if you are crazy enough to write, you can write my MATLAB problems for Pearson and you can Creative Commons them technically, but you can't use them anywhere else outside their walled garden. Uh, that's, that's the exact opposite of what I want from here. Eventually, I want to actually uh, support web work problems being hosted on uh, the, uh, the, the Check It website, but I'm going to have to support Perl scripts instead of just Sage scripts as well in order for that to happen one day, someday. The other question from John Sebastian is you have one question per slug, multiple questions on the All right. So you may feel that um, these are two samey, these different versions. Um, so my philosophy is this. I try to produce problems that are uh, broad enough in scope so that no matter what version a student gets, it covers the entire learning outcome. So here, I wanted to make sure that they understood how to handle a double root in the characteristic uh, equation, the differential equation. And I wanted to make sure they knew what to do if their roots were imaginary. And that's why I wrote it in two parts, rather than having two separate versions. But um, if you really want to have drastically looking different versions, you can. Um, the way you would do that is uh, on the proper uh, tab is in your generator. Call this up. Uh, I would do it. Version A. I'll just copy it, pretend that they're different. Version B. And then def uh, generate, that would just then be a uh, return voice um, of either version A or version B. That'd be the quickest way I would implement that. So I would randomly choose a version um, between those two. And then uh, if I go back, it should still build, I think. So of course it's tough doing the same thing both ways, so you can't really tell. You could also, uh, you, know, you could do some extra work to tell it which version it is if you want to put that in your description or whatever, but certainly that you can make these as drastically different as you want, but of course, the more different, different versions look, the more work it is to write the code to make that happen. Um, great, but yeah, that, that is something where my personal philosophy is to try and write exercises that any random exercise could assess the outcome and I try to write them of similar difficulty. So I try to avoid edge cases like what's the derivative of zero, for example, from popping up uh, while that, you know, um, yeah, so that's kind of where I go with that. Um, cool. Any other thoughts or questions? 
Can you say a little more about, um, so this is serverless, so is what, you, what I think is really a great, a great way to go. Um, so this cocal, um, dot com. it's it's a virtual, it's a Linux box, judging from your command line yeah. interface there. And look, I, I only run Linux at home and on my, and my work machine. So I could just, I could like run Sage math on my machine and just run that code on my machine, couldn't I? Correct, yeah, there's no reason. And what it does is just, so that it, it's not running Sage for the problem. So, it, so it, the, I would run Sage to generate the problem. It would generate all those HTML files and the pretext files then I have to load them onto a server that would show display the HTML files and would know how to interpret the pretext files. Is that is that correct? Right. Yeah. So so you can do whatever you want with these HTMLs. The main uh, thing you would do with it is uh, if you have Canvas, you can do the Canvas stuff that I I write up because I use Canvas. Um, right. If you have a different LMS, eventually I want to get to all LMSs that use the standard format, but I haven't found the bandwidth to do that yet. That's a grant, hopefully someday, maybe. But uh, yeah, um, you're right. At the end of the day, the serverless solution is let's put it all into HTML that you can serve wherever you want. The website, if you want to put it on my public website, what it actually does is there's a JSON blob, uh, just a big data file that it, it checks all the versions into. And it just reads that uh, if I hit refresh. That's what it did for like two seconds was it downloaded a megabyte of, or it probably just checked that it was cached on the computer already. Um, and then it's just using JavaScript to take the built HTML. You can see it here. All this is doing is just reading HTML and displaying it to the user. There's no like actual math happening on the presentation layer. Same thing with, uh, you know, Canvas. This is just an image that has the LaTeX embedded into the image URL that this uh, CodeCox website knows how to parse and present as an image. So uh, it's, it's all static. Basically, you take your Linux box. Uh, if you want to do it that way, I actually use CoCalc myself. Um, there's also an open version of CoCalc called, uh, that uses Docker that lets you run it locally. Um, the nice thing about that is just everything's installed for you already. I don't have a lot of support at the moment, but if, it, if it's important to you, I can help you track down any dependencies that I was not careful to find because it, it just works on CoCalc. But certainly it's all just a bunch of Linux things strung together. And the big thing that would be difficult on your local machine would be, uh, I mean, you couldn't run the notebook, but you could copy paste this into your uh, your uh, Sage Math uh, REPL, or you could copy paste into a Sage file and then just, you know, Sage preview.sage instead. And it would work just as well. This is just a nice, uh, Oh, yeah, you'd have to change this display, this presentation layer stuff. Um, but it's certainly all there. At the end of the day, however you want to author it is up to you. This is the easiest way that I would, that I would support officially and recommend for folks. But if you're able to produce a bunch of Sage files and PTX files that, that build, oops, I didn't mean to press that, that build using this code right here into a build folder. If you can get this building, all this stuff right here, then I can take that, put it on my website, and share it with other instructors who don't want to do all the work that we want to do to to author these the first time. Um, they could just take the, our, the the fruits of our labor and quickly do a good. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, mastery grading, but but I hope it is personally because I feel like that's a good way to to go. But they can use this in whatever you know domain they want to use it in. If you're willing to, and we need to talk about licensing at some point. I have not put enough thought into that. Probably some sort of Creative Commons for the uh, for the templates, and then uh, probably some MIT license or something. Uh, if, if licensing is important to you, you could probably I didn't think about the right way. Probably put it somewhere in here what the license is for uh, reuse of this material. Um, it would just have to be something that's uh, open source enough for me to be able to use it on my website. You know, if you if you'd ever like to talk to some, I, I I teach for the Creative Commons organization how to do good licensing things. So if you'd ever like to talk to someone about about more about that, I'd love to chat with you about it. Um, can I ask you one? So one last question. So because it's all static, by the time it's in Canvas or on a website or something, 
things with um, mathematical interactivity, like, uh, you know, like a graph, sometimes you see fancy problem systems where there's a graph that you can zoom or rotate a three dimensional things. Um, actually graphics in general is kind of a question. Um, all of these things would be harder to do. You, you're, you're super good with mathematical formulae and text, but other more, more complicated things, hard to do. This is future work, absolutely. So uh, what I've done as a stopgap is uh, let's say for example, slope fields. Um, I can show you what I did there. Yes, good. So this all works because we're online. Um, and so what I did because we're online uh, is um, I just pointed them to the Sage Cell uh, website because it's uh, quicker than CoCalc. And I gave them some code to paste into here that produced the image. So that was my way I cheated it currently. But you're right, um, future the expansion for this is Sage has a lot of built-in. Oh, I'm not going to remember how to do this off the top of my head, how to plot. Um, John Sebastian, do you know how to quickly write a draw? Keep, I don't know. How to, maybe I could get lucky with just plot x squared. I really don't remember. Um, oh, I am lucky. Okay, so it's just that easy. So uh, obviously the goal would be you're writing all this stuff in Sage code. There's support on the sage end for producing the graphics how do i get that built into um these problems especially when we consider this is now a static image serving static images is a lot harder than serving just html um where's it gonna go especially if you have versions that are like private versions that you only want to see on a canvas page i haven't solved that problem yet it's something that is certainly technically feasible um, so couldn't the pretext code have like URLs in it, right? You could, yes. Yes. So if you, this would take some extra work on on your end personally, um, but it maybe so maybe the, the answer to this question is eventually at checkit.clons.org. Um, I closed that, but at checkit.clons.org, I will have support for not just the public versions, but maybe a handful of instructor only versions that don't show up on the website, but I do host the images for them on the website. So you can link to them um, through, um, if you're like doing like the canvas, for example. Now, if you're doing um, LaTeX, I'd have to think about how do I get the image into the right place so the LaTeX code can see the image the, for the right version of the image for this version. Um, there is support for uh, embedding it as base 64, if that means anything um, to folks. Um, it actually, I tried that. That was my original plan was to just use base 64 to embed it as just a bunch of um, alphanumeric characters in the source code for every end version. Um, but that breaks in a lot of situations where you wouldn't want it to break. So uh, um, anyway, short version is, I don't have any official support for images. If you think of a clever way of doing it, let me know. Um, but that's definitely on the the, the back burner is to, to get image support, um, hopefully someday soon. Folks, I'm going to have to wrap it up in another uh, minute or two. Um, John Sebastian asked, how does pretext to do it? How does pretext do what? Save images. Right, so pretext uh, takes images and basically just copies them over to the build folder. Um, well, it just depends whether you're talking about pretext CLI, which I work on, or just the default pretext, which I have to think a few more beats about how it does the copying over of things. Um, but it's basically just copying images over from one place to the other and telling LaTeX where to look for it. Um, the, that's not the hard part, it's the versioning that's gonna be harder. I have to think a little bit more about is do I really, especially if I'm producing like PDFs, like do I want a thousand different versions on the image on my computer, I don't want those temporary on my computer and then delete them all when I'm done. So I don't have a bunch of cached images somewhere. Um, yeah, images creates a lot of file space issues like uh, that I haven't wrapped my head around how I wanted to solve in general yet. All right, any other quick questions? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the, the recording.